Welcome to the Physician's Guide to Financial Wellness, the podcast dedicated to helping physicians in Michigan turn their professional success into financial success while enjoying life along the way. And now, here are your hosts, Andrew Mushbaugh and Trent DeBruin. Hi, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Physician's Guide to Financial Wellness. This is Trent DeBruin, and I'm joined, as always, by my co-host, Andrew Mushbaugh. And today, we're going to talk about pursuing early financial independence. And we know this is a common topic in the physician community, given how challenging the career can be, but people don't always understand exactly what early financial independence is or what all goes into achieving it. So we wanted to take some time to shed some light on the topic and help explain it for everyone. And Andrew, just to confirm, you're not planning to pursue early financial independence on me and retire from MD Wealth Management in your 30s, are you? Yeah, I don't think that's in the card, but don't worry. Even if it was the case, it's going to be a long time before you can get rid of me. (laughs) All right, good. Well, let's jump right into it. And why don't you start out by talking a little bit about exactly what early financial independence is? Yeah. So the first distinction we want to make is between financial independence and retirement. And we define financial independence as the point where you can sustain your lifestyle based on the savings and investments you've accumulated without needing to rely on a paycheck. In other words, it's the point where work becomes optional. Retirement, on the other hand, is when you actually stop working. So while you need to be financially independent to retire, you don't need to retire once you're financially independent. And when it comes to retirement, the traditional retirement age is around 65. So when we think about early financial independence, we're talking about becoming financially independent earlier than the traditional retirement age. It could be 60, 55, 50, or something else, but that's what we're talking about. So it's being able to live off your savings and investments without needing to work for the income prior to the traditional retirement age. And when it comes to financial independence for physicians, the most common reason people think of is burnout. But that's not the only reason for pursuing it. Sure, for a certain percentage of people, that is the reason. They want to reach it as early as possible because of some combination of work-related stress from the hours or day-to-day work involved. And it's hard to imagine doing so until age 65 or beyond. However, for many other people, financial independence is simply about freedom and flexibility. There's something liberating about no longer needing to rely on your job for the paycheck and you'd instead decide to go to work every day because you want to, not because you have to. And that alone can often reduce stress and change the way you look at your career. Another part of this flexibility is the ability to pursue other interests, whether those are things traditionally associated with retirement, like more travel or volunteer work, or things associated with your career, like pursuing a new position, adjusting your schedule, or starting a business. But whatever the reason, at the heart of it, early financial independence is about reaching the point where work becomes optional, since you have enough money and savings and investments to live off year to year. And from there, you can decide what you want to do with that optionality. And with that overview, a natural next question is, so how do I know how much I need to become financially independent? So I'll touch on how to figure out your quote-unquote number for financial independence. And as we've discussed in prior episodes, when it comes to investing, there's a rule of thumb known as the 4% rule that says that if you have a well-diversified investment portfolio of 60% stocks and 40% bonds, you can safely withdraw approximately 4% of the initial value of your portfolio year after year over longer periods of time, think multiple decades, without running out of money. Now, it's worth noting that the 4% rule is based on studies of historical stock market returns. And while there's no guarantee that it'll persist in the future, it's a good starting point when thinking about how much money you need to become financially independent. So as a quick back of the napkin calculation, you can take the 4% rule along with what you expect your annual living expenses to be when you're financially independent to calculate roughly how much you'll need. When thinking about your living expenses, keep in mind how they might change at that point in your life, especially if you do have plans to stop working entirely and will have more time on your hands to pursue things like travel and hobbies. It's also a good idea to add a little cushion for lumpier, less frequent expenses like new cars, paying for weddings, periodic home projects, etc. But once you have an accurate number for your expected annual expenses, simply divide this number by 4% or multiply it by 25 to get your target number for how much you'll need in total investments. As a simple example, say you figure out that your annual expenses will be $150,000 per year. Take that number and multiply it by 25, and you'll find that you'd need total investments of around $3.75 million to be able to live off your investments year after year without being reliant on a job or other income. Now, there are a couple things worth noting here. One is that this doesn't take into account any other potential income sources once you're financially independent. For example, you'll eventually start receiving Social Security. And two, the studies on a safe withdrawal rate look at a 30-year time period, whereas if you're pursuing early financial independence and are planning to retire at that point, that time period when you'll be withdrawing from your portfolio will likely be longer than 30 years. That being said, these two factors tend to offset each other. So net-net, the 4% rule is still a good approximation for figuring out your number for early financial independence. And if you want to be extra conservative, you could use something like a 3.5% rule instead. So it's one thing to know your target number in terms of the size of your investments to reach early financial independence. But another thing is you have to know what you want to do when you get there. 
especially if you're earlier in your career and earlier on in the process of saving and investing. Now, when we walk through this process with clients, we run detailed retirement calculations, factoring in taxes, inflation, investment return assumptions, and the variability of investment returns over time. But you can still do an approximate calculation on your own. But at a basic level, what you're trying to do here is to calculate or figure out how much you need to save and invest each year to reach your target investment number on your desired timeline for financial independence. And if you've already done this calculation that Trent just walked through of figuring out your target investment portfolio, and you know when you want to become financially independent, you already have two of the three important variables. The final one, and probably the trickiest one as well, is deciding what to assume for an annual investment return for your portfolio, since this will have a big impact in determining how much you need to save and invest each year. Just to provide some general perspective, historically stocks have produced roughly 10% annual returns, while bonds have provided 4 to 5% returns. However, there's no guarantee that future returns will be similar, and the actual return you earn will depend on how your portfolio is invested, how you manage it over time, and what investment returns the stock and bond markets actually provide. And also, year to year, market returns will inevitably be different than what you assume, which is why this is a constantly evolving process where you need to revisit it each year and tweak and adjust over time based on how things actually play out. But just to provide a simplified example to give you a sense of what we're potentially looking at for required annual savings, let's say you had a 35-year-old physician who has $100,000 saved up in their investment accounts, so someone earlier in their career and early in the process of saving and investing. We'll use the same scenario Trent just discussed, where this person's annual living expenses are $150,000, and because of that, they calculated that they need to reach $3.75 million in investments to become financially independent. We'll also assume that their investments are 100% in stocks, and they're in a 7% inflation-adjusted investment return year in and year out. So roughly 10% returns, less 3% for a rising cost of living, which we refer to as inflation. Now, of course, we know this scenario wouldn't actually play out this conveniently, but it's still helpful for illustrative purposes. And while using these assumptions and assuming this physician wants to become financially independent at age 55, you could back into their required annual savings, which would be around $85,000. So that's the money they would need to save and invest each year across their various retirement savings accounts to reach that $3.75 million portfolio at age 55, assuming everything we just outlined. Now, to look at a slightly different scenario, let's say that instead of wanting to be financially independent at age 55, this person wants to move that timeline up a bit to age 50 instead. Well, here, there are fewer years where they'll be saving and investing, so the amount they need to save and invest each year is higher. In that case, it comes out to around $140,000 per year, which as expected, wanting to be financially independent just five years earlier comes with a much larger savings target. Again, this would just be the starting point for this physician, and they would want to revisit this calculation and their assumptions each year based on how things change and how their investments actually perform. And obviously, the amounts involved will vary based on the specifics of your situation and the assumptions that you use for investment returns. But the main takeaway is to understand at least roughly what's required to save in order to reach financial independence when you want. And after hearing that, it might seem daunting to imagine saving and investing that much money year in and year out. So we want to take a minute to share a little perspective about the trade-offs involved and things to consider when pursuing early financial independence. Now, if you've listened to other episodes of the podcast, You'll know that we're big fans of balance when it comes to managing your finances and for life in general. And for many people, the idea of saving $100,000 or more each year just for retirement might be hard to imagine, depending on your life situation, income and expenses, especially if you have kids with the extra costs and potentially college savings required there. Well, if that's how you feel, that's okay. There's really no right or wrong answer when it comes to pursuing early financial independence. And it just depends on your situation and what you're able to do and which trade-offs you're willing to make. While some physicians are able to save and invest the amount required for early financial independence, while at the same time not making any sacrifices to their lifestyle, for many people, it'll require pulling back a little on certain areas of spending, or at least keeping spending steady over time and avoiding lifestyle creep. It all comes down to what's most important to you in terms of being able to enjoy more of your money along the way versus being financially independent at your desired age. And Andrew and I both have the perspective of making sure we plan for the future, but also knowing that we're never guaranteed tomorrow. So while we both have target ages for financial independence, we don't want to make sacrifices to our lifestyles beyond that to potentially become financially independent a few years earlier. So we both take a balanced approach when it comes to this. We won't want to pass on things now like vacations with our families or other fun experiences to make memories with them in order to be able to save a little more along the way. That being said, we also have the luxury of loving our jobs and never wanting to fully retire, which makes it easier to have this perspective. And for us, financial independence goals are about freedom and flexibility rather than wanting to stop working. But we know that for other people, there might be a different perspective where it's just not possible or doable to continue with your job beyond a certain age. So early financial independence is a must regardless of the sacrifices involved. But as an overall takeaway, know that becoming financially independent earlier than the traditional retirement age is naturally going to require you saving and investing a higher percentage of your income each year along the way. 
That exact amount and percentage is going to vary depending on the specifics of your situation. But once you know how much that is, it's helpful to consider that within the context of your current life and situation and decide whether the required trade-offs are worth it. You might even decide on a compromise situation where you pursue early financial independence, but at a later age than you were initially thinking, in order to strike a better balance of enjoying your money and making fewer sacrifices along the way. Just understand that if you pursue early financial independence, your path and your financial situation will be a bit different than friends or colleagues with a traditional retirement goal. And the important thing is finding the approach that works for you. Yeah, it's really helpful to think about the trade-offs involved. But for those of you who are planning to pursue early financial independence, on a practical level, we want to talk a little bit about some of the accounts that are helpful to use when saving and investing for it. Now, one of the first things to understand is that the main retirement accounts most physicians save to, like your 403b or 401k, have certain requirements for how old you have to be before you can withdraw the money without paying a penalty. For these accounts, if you take out money prior to age 59 and a half, you have to pay a 10% penalty. So if you're planning to pursue financial independence in retirement earlier than that age, you'll want to have other accounts as well where you can take money from them at a younger age and avoid that penalty. Also, as you can see from the examples we shared and the numbers we walked through, If you're pursuing early financial independence, you'll almost certainly need to save much more each year than simply maxing out your 403b or 401k. And so you'll have other accounts where you direct the additional savings to. And among the other accounts, one great option that many of the physicians in our area have access to is a 457b. This account is similar to a 403b and 401k in that it's provided by your employer and allows you to make contributions directly from your paycheck while receiving a tax deduction in the process, but it has more flexibility when it comes to the age at which you can withdraw the money. Unlike a 403b or 401k, where you have to wait until age 59 and a half to avoid a penalty, with a 457b, you can start withdrawing the money at any age, as long as you're no longer working for the employer where you contributed to that 457b. Now, there are a few other aspects of 457bs that you want to consider, depending on the type of 457b you have. So be sure to listen to our episode on the waterfall of retirement savings by account, where we talk through this in more detail. But keep in mind, this account becomes even more valuable for those pursuing early financial independence. And after you take advantage of all the tax advantage savings space you have, you're really only left with the option of saving to a taxable investment account, also commonly referred to as a brokerage account, individual account, or joint account. When saving for retirement, we always advocate filling up all of your tax advantage savings space first, since the tax advantages make the money you save go even further. But most people pursuing early financial independence will fill up all their tax advantage space and still need some place to save and invest, which is where the taxable account comes into play. The nice thing about a taxable account is that it has total flexibility when it comes to withdrawing the money. You can take it out at any age for any reason without a penalty. You just have to pay taxes on the gains for any investments you sell. Unlike the other retirement accounts, a tax account also provides the opportunity to do something called tax loss harvesting during periods where the stock market is temporarily down, and you're able to then capture temporary investment losses as a tax deduction. But bigger picture, if you're pursuing early financial independence and you do end up retiring once you become financially independent, you'll need investment accounts that you can take money from during the years between retirement and age 59 and a half, which is the point when you can start withdrawing from your 403b, 401k, and IRAs penalty-free. So a 457B, if you at least have access to one, and a taxable account provide that flexibility. It's also nice to have a mix of different accounts with varying tax treatment for when you retire. By having a mix of accounts you can withdraw from to fund your living expenses, it allows you to better take advantage of the tax planning opportunities from retirement through a couple key windows, which if you're interested in learning more about those windows and how to plan around them, we did an entire podcast, episode 15, on the topic of tax planning in retirement. Well, that covers it for today's episode, and hopefully that was a helpful discussion for everyone around early financial independence, what goes into it, and some of the areas to understand if you're pursuing it. As we mentioned, there's no right or wrong answer here in terms of whether or not to pursue early financial independence or at what age to go for it if you do. We just encourage everyone to keep the big picture and context in mind when thinking about it and be mindful of the trade-offs involved and how important those are relative to the early financial independence goal. As we discussed in more detail on the How We Manage Our Finances episode, episode number 17, Andrew and I both like the idea of early financial independence, but mainly from the perspective of the flexibility, freedom, and peace of mind it provides, rather than wanting to retire at a certain age, since we both love our jobs and want to continue working with clients as long as we can. So with that in mind, we both have age 55 as an approximate target date for financial independence, but with no plans to retire and also not as a rigid date because neither of us wants to sacrifice things in terms of enjoyment or experiences with our families between now and then. So that's how we approach it. But as we mentioned, there's no right or wrong answer here. And just to summarize the takeaways from some of the concepts we covered, number one, financial independence is the point where you can sustain your lifestyle based on the investments you've accumulated. In other words, the point where work becomes optional. Number two, to get a rough idea of the approximate value of investments you need to become financially independent, 
you can use the 4% rule where you take your annual living expenses and divide them by 4% or multiply them by 25. Number three, to figure out how much you need to save and invest each year to reach your financial independence goal, you can take your target investment portfolio, your age for financial independence, and make an assumption for investment returns to back into approximately how much you need to save and invest each year. Number four, for most people, pursuing early financial independence will require saving a relatively higher percentage of your income each year, at least compared to people with a traditional retirement goal. So be sure to weigh the trade-offs involved along the way. And number five, if you're planning to pursue early financial independence and retire when you do, you'll want to be saving and investing to accounts that you can tap during your early years of retirement. So consider a 457B if you have access to one and a taxable account in addition to your traditional retirement savings accounts like a 403b or 401k. Well, thanks everyone for joining us for another episode of the show. We love talking about financial independence and all the other podcast topics we've covered. So if you have any questions or comments you'd like to share, feel free to email us at info at mdwmlc.com. And as always, you can access the show notes at mdwmlc.com slash podcast. Take care, everyone, and we'll look forward to talking to you again soon. Want even more ideas, tools, and resources on how to make smart financial decisions? Check out the resources section of MD Wealth Management's website at mdwmllc.com, where you'll find additional knowledge and insight for Michigan physicians, including a blog, ebook, and one page guides. While there, you can also schedule a 15 minute conversation with Andrew and Trent to learn more about what it means to work with the firm and how they serve physicians. If you've enjoyed the content, please leave a review on iTunes and share with your friends and colleagues. Thanks so much for listening. Andrew Mushbaugh and Trent DeBruin are certified financial planners, principals, and co-founders of MD Wealth Management, a registered investment advisory firm in the state of Michigan. All opinions shared in the show are for general information and are not intended to provide specific advice or recommendations for any individual. All performance reference is historical and no guarantee of future returns. Please consult with your legal advisor, your tax advisor, or your financial advisor before making any decisions.